Morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for uh, for coming to our press conference today. Uh, my name is David McNeil. I'm an ex-board member of the uh, club, and I'm a freelance journalist. Um, well, uh, as everybody in this room will surely know, uh, the uh, Rohingya uh, are a group of approximately uh, one million uh, Muslims uh, who uh, uh, lived or lived in uh, Myanmar, uh, in the country's west. Uh, hundreds of thousands of them. Uh, of course, have fled to neighboring Bangladesh amid uh, very credible allegations of uh, genocide by the Myanmar military. Uh, as you also know, of course, uh, the Myanmar de facto leader, uh, Aung San Suu Kyi, was uh, here in this country this month. Uh, and for many, uh, her responses on the issue of the Myanmarese uh, problem and uh, the Rohingya was evasive and unsatisfactory. And uh, Prime Minister Shinzo Abe uh, also was questioned on this, but he did little to uh, put her on the spot, uh, presumably because of Japan's economic involvement in the country. Uh, that makes our speaker today uh, very timely. Uh, Dr. Uh, Maung Zarni uh, is a uh, veteran activist. Uh, he has told me that he's been involved in the struggle uh, for the Rohingya for 30 years, so he's battle-scarred. He's the leader of the Free Rohingya Coalition. Uh, he's also an academic and a well-known campaigner for the rights of Myanmar's beleaguered minority. Uh, he is going to speak for about 20 minutes on this issue uh, in English. Uh, we'd also like to just introduce, uh, we believe from the floor, there are two other people who would like to make a comment. I think uh, we have uh, Michimi Muranushi, is that right? Uh, a professor at the Department of Law at Gakshuin University and uh, Zhao Min Hut, who's the di executive director of the Rohingya Advocacy Network in Japan. Uh, those two people will also be asked to give comments, but they're not sitting at the table. Uh, can I just, a couple of bookkeeping things, can I just ask you if you'd be kind enough to sw make sure that your mobile phones are switched off before we begin? Uh, and would you give uh, Dr. Zarni your best attention, please? Thank you. Um, <clears throat> good morning, everybody. I'm really pleased to be here, uh, particularly the, um, the subject matter concerns the grievous crimes that uh, my own you know, uh, colleagues, friends, and classmates, and family friends have been involved in various capacities. Um, I want to make uh, four points. One is uh, personal, because uh, you know, I understand that this is the uh, issue about the, the Rohingya people, uh, but I think where I come from uh, as a person is, is quite relevant here. Uh, I'm not here as an um, average Burmese. I came from a Buddhist, predominantly ethnically Burmese, and extended military family. Yeah. And my, two of my great uncles have great ties with this armed forces and my extended family members from both my mother's side and father's side have served in this armed forces. And my late great uncle was Aung San Suu Kyi's father's uh, classmate, friend, and next door neighbor when they were young post-teenagers studying at Rangoon University. And the younger brother of that uh, great uncle was the first commanding officer under whom the retired dictator General Than Shui served. And in fact, it was him, my own late great uncle, who married Than Shui and his first wife. And the, the, my own uncle, my mother's younger brother, was VIP pilot from the Air Force for General Nguyen for 25 years. I was a military academy cadet who did not join the armed forces. So, so I have a very, very long family connection with this armed forces. And I grew up thinking that to love Burma is not simply to be Buddhist, but to join the military service. That is the ultimate expression of patriotism. And not far from here, there was a you know, Nakanoku Japanese Imperial Army Intelligence Training School. 
That was the school that produced uh, General Nguyen and several other young Burmese nationalists to study under Kim Pei Tai, Japanese fascist military intelligence. And I also wrote the first ever study from the University of Washington Law School that called my own country's geno genocide by its own name. So that aside, I want to uh, talk about facts and fictions, facts and myths about the Rohingya. We cannot have a, either accurate reporting or serious policy discussions unless we know what the facts are. The facts are the Rohingyas are officially considered in writing in the Burmese Language Encyclopedia, Volume 9, 1964, published by the government of Burma. In fact, it was published two years after Nguyen came to power in a military coup in 1962. In Burmese language, this is a photocopy of an authentic document. Aung San Suu Kyi has access to this. Everyone has access to this document. It says irrefutably and unequivocally and officially, Rohingya people are an official ethnic minority who has an ancestral land in northern Rakhine state of Myanmar. They are predominantly Muslim. There are some Hindu Rohingyas, so meaning that Rohingya is an ethnic identity, not a Muslim identity. They are f mostly farmers and fishermen, and their faith is Islam. This is what the Burmese government said officially. Yeah? And the Burmese government also claim, and the Burmese public blindly believe, that Rohingyas are agricultural migrant workers. That came after 1824. That was the year when we had the first Anglo-Burmese war, and we lost that in, uh, within a year. So they are colonial migrant workers, unwanted and unwelcome. But they were there as a result of the British colonial annexation of Western Burma, today called Rakhine. That is what the Burmese government claim. This is the fact. This is historical primary evidence. This is as primary as any historical evidence can get. Published 10 years after the French Revolution in 1798. At the Royal, this was a, 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 from a paper that was given by the uh, then British East India Company staff and Scottish medical doctor by the name of Francis Buchanan. And he was also an, at what we would call ethno-linguist. So he said here, the Rohingyas are a group native to Arakan, meaning Rakhine. They are Mohammedans, followers of Muhammad. They speak a language called Rohingya. Yeah. And so these are the facts that the country and it all pillars of the Burmese society, starting with the spiritual leaders, meaning Buddhist monks and nuns, intellectual class, including overwhelming majority of the Burmese journalists, academics, writers, cartoonists, artists, movie stars, models, yeah, all the way down to the farmers and rickshaw drivers, and fishermen, and Aung San Suu Kyi, various presidents, and commanders in chief, reject. This is what they say. These are official lies. We don't have a group called Rohingyas. This was Thane Saint X general and president, who gave a, an address at Chatham House in London, on the on the uh, I think like 14th of July 20, 2013. We wrote through 10 days ago, don't destroy our country by creating a fake ethnic group. Number three, this is from Senior General Mei Online. 
who is wanted at the ICC as far as the uh, United Nations fact-finding mich uh, mission. They are descendants of the colonial era Bengali migrant farm workers whose presence is an unfinished business. The finished business is post-genocide. And then finally, but not least, Aung San Suu Kyi had the audacity in the face of irrefutable evidence that these are our own people, despite the fact that they are darker skinned, they are Muslims, and they may have a bi uh, origins, like Indian subcontinental and, and uh, Arakani, so Myanmar. Don't use the word Rohingya. This is the, the line that Suu Kyi has taken consistently against United Nations, and this is her telling U.S. Ambassador Scott Marcial just a few months before she took the, re the reins of the uh, civilian government. So we have two different uh, versions. One is factual. That supports the Rohingyas claim that they belong in Burma and they are an ethnic nationality and they enjoyed full and equal citizenship in the Union of Myanmar. And they are not demanding self-determination. They are not armed, despite the fact there is a small group of like radical uh, militants who have been born into the genocidal conditions all their life. And out of desperation and rage, like any young self-respecting man would do, or woman would do, who rise up. You know, resistance could be found even in the uh, German concentration camps in places like Auschwitz. So because of the official lies coming from the monks, the highest national leaders, we have created as a nation, not just simply as the military that pulled the trigger, genocidal myths about Rohingyas. These myths are very important. In the media language, you will call them framing of a targeted community. These framings include strategic responses, and what we are seeing is a genocidal persecution. And, and at that persecution hinges primarily on these myths. So in the eyes of the Buddhist, they are so shocked and emotionally hurt uh, when the world, United Nations and people like myself and uh, journalists who look at the facts and report on the facts say Burma is committing a genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes, or in a more diluted uh, word, uh, ethnic cleansing. They are shocked because they think their soldiers, the politicians like Su Chi, are all defending the Buddhist way of life, you know, sorting the illegal migration problem. When you define the um, a human community as illegal migrants, of course you have to take legal actions. Yeah. That's a policy response that is built in, inherent in the, uh, the framing. They are, the Rohingyas are portrayed as land thieves. Well, if, you, if people, you know, what do you do with thieves? In all society, thieves get, uh, you know, subject to different types of punishment from chopping off you know, the, uh, the uh, hands to caning to more modern and liberal form of um, uh, punishment. They are Islamist invaders hell-bent on uh, <clears throat> uh, Islamicizing the country and turning a Buddhist country, predominantly Buddhist country, into a Muslim country. They are viruses. That's the medical. Di viruses need to be uh, eliminated. Yeah, they need to be, so, th and then the militaries view them as a national security threat because of the 17 Muslim communities in total that are scattered across different regions of Myanmar, Rohingyas are the only group that has been recognized as an, a, a Muslim community with their own ancestral land that is proven historically and that was once recognized officially as a Mayu Frontier District. And the, the second reason that they are guilty in the eyes of the Burmese military is they are right next to one of the largest uh, Muslim countries, Bangladesh, landmass, you know, half the size of Burma, 
But population wise, three times as many as Burmese a population at 160 million in Bangladesh. And so in the, in the event that Bangladesh wanted to relieve its demographic, demographic pressure, this land could be snatched by Rohingya, uh, Bangladesh using ba uh, Rohingyas as a proxy. And then finally, an enemy of Buddhism. So like a monks got you know, uh, exercised and they got involved. And so if you go with the popular myths and official lies, Rohingyas get framed as you know and and on you know it is to be expected that burma has, has launched the genocide over the last 17 eight years and then finally like genocide is not just simply about mass killings you know i mean i, I there are there there are two sets of handouts there and uh, that's straight from the united nations uh, officially yesterday the um, the head of the mission that in an unprecedented move without going th through any judicial tribunal, call this genocide against the Rohingya, war crimes and crimes against humanity, against Kachin, uh, Christians, and uh, Shan minorities and others in two Shan and Kachin state right alongside the Chinese border. And uh, we call this the slow burning nature of uh, genocide. Yesterday, Former Attorney General of Indonesia, Darusa, Ma Mazuki Darusa, briefed the Security Council and told them genocide is ongoing and close to half a million uh, Rohingyas are actually trapped inside. And that's a population Aung San Suu Kyi points to and say the world is fussing over these like people that are fleeing. Half of the Rohingya population stay. Why do they stay? If we are committing a genocide, why would half the population and in the other half fled? No, the fact is there are more Rohingyas, close to two millions around the world. 300,000 in Saudi Arabia, 100, 1 million in Bangladesh. Over the last 40 years since the first state-directed violence against Rohingya began in February 1978, we have essentially emptied the Rohingya land of the population. We want the land, we want the resources, we want to control the Arakan Strip for strategic reasons, and China wants to have a, a base there. China has twin gas and oil pipeline because it's important to China. Japan gets involved. Japan wants to contain China's influence. India wants to contain China. USA wants to contain China. Corporations want resources off the uh, Rohingya coastline. We have one of the 10 largest natural gas deposits in the world. And about 10 countries are involved, including the peace-loving Norway. So the, yesterday, the uh, fact-finding mission chief, uh, the, Mr. The Rusan, told the Security Council that genocide is ongoing. It is not finished, and uh, that there are reasons that he said that basically structures that, uh, of repression, institutions of repressions, the commanders, policy makers, whitewashers like Aung San Suu Kyi, they remain intact in their places. One year after the genocide has become the headlines defining the Burmese issue in the world, United Nations has failed to take the, uh, any initiative to stop the genocide. And this is the 11th hour, the equivalent of bomb the train track moment for the, uh, the Nazi regime. And shamefully, Japan, that created the armed forces of Burma, where my family has served for three generations, is collaborating at worst and standing by as the, 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 pa the Japanese patronized Tamado or armed forces is committing war crimes, crimes against humanity and genocide. It's one thing that Japan refuses to acknowledge fully and come to terms like the, like the, uh, the, the uh, post-Nazi Germany has done with the atrocity that Hitler regime had committed. Japan has the audacity to collaborate with the regime that is backed up by the um, Burmese military that Japan patronized. Japan just not simply patronized 
uh, the regime in the, before the war. It has consistently sided with the Burmese military leadership. The lion's share of war reparation, about 200 million US dollars in 1958, went to the Burmese military. All successive Burmese military governments have enjoyed unconditional support from Tokyo. It is time that our Bay government totally review the policy towards Burma. One thing you don't acknowledge your own war crimes and fascism and atrocities you committed in Manchuria, Burma, and other places all across Southeast Asia. Another thing you are going along with another regime that the United Nations calls war criminal, genocidal regime, and criminals against humanity. Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, powerful stuff. Um, uh, we're going to ask um, the professor for a comment, if you could uh, come to the mic, and if you could keep it, if possible, to five minutes. Would that, is that all right? Um, <clears throat> now, what we, I think we would be interested in hearing, if you're able to address it, is exactly Japan's culpability. Any detail on that that you can, that you can divulge? Thank you. <coughs> I'd like to tell uh, a few things uh, about uh, the relations of the problem. So, uh, sorry, Japan. Professor, just tell us who you are, would you, if you don't uh, mind. My name is Michimi Muranoshi. I'm a professor teaching international politics in the Department of Law uh, at Gakushin University. Uh, I think, first, uh, the, the Japanese government still refuses to use the term Rohingya. Uh, according to the request, of the uh, government of Myanmar. Uh, but uh, the United States, as you know, uses the term Rohingya. And uh, Japanese is a government, uh, the Japanese government often defends that the United States and Japan uh, share common values. Second, uh, after August 25th last year, the Japanese government express, expressed its deep condolence for the people the security people killed by the ARSA uh, in the August 25th uh, uh, um, so-called attack. However, the Japanese government, after the news, overwhelming news, that uh, one uh, tens of thousand people uh, were killed by uh, the government forces, security forces, uh, those, for those killed Rohingyas, the Japanese government are yet to express any condolence. When I asked one of the government officials about what is the difference between the two things, he told me that uh, on the first, the ARSA has recognized, but for the latter, it is still not confirmed. So, uh, despite the fact that there are photos, uh, there are uh, UN reports and other kinds of reports attesting that uh, atrocities have been committed, the Japanese have very unbalanced attitude to the two kinds of victims. Uh, third, uh, I think uh, there, uh, there are huge interest of Japanese economy uh, in Burma. When I checked the, the names of the companies that are donating money to the LDP, and uh, the companies who are doing business, especially in the Tirawa area of Myanmar, the names of the companies are almost the same. Uh, and uh, Lately, uh, in advisory, from the advisory board, uh, the former U, uh, U.S. ambassador to the Uni uh, United Nations, uh, Mr. Richardson, resigned from the advisory board, uh, saying that this is a committee uh, in order to whitewash the atrocities. And lately, uh, a new uh, another kind of committee in order to uh, investigate what happened 
was made, and uh, one of the Japanese, who is a former uh, Japanese ambassador to the United Nations, uh, was named. And he has started working. So uh, if you compare the two things, that uh, what is now uh, built, uh, made at a new committee, has the same kind of purpose uh, as the last one, but the Japanese government is willing to participate in the process whose only purpose seems to be to whitewash or the, uh, what is alleged, uh, according to them, what is alleged by the international community. So uh, in the area of foreign policy, uh, I think uh, there is, in my view, not much democracy in Japan. In elections, not many people hear about it. In the press, not many people read about it. And uh, lately, people know that there is a huge refugee community in Bangladesh. But other than that, uh, they don't know that the refugee community is only a part of the problem. As Mr. Zani said, uh, it is genocide, and uh, it is, needs to be reported uh, that the fact the real problem is much more bigger than just returning those refugees to Myanmar. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, just on that subject, uh, Zani-san, have you had much interest in the Japanese media? Um, we have had um, uh, Newsweek and HK um, uh, Japanese uh, taken an interest, and um, also there are a lot of uh, well-meaning uh, Japanese uh, researchers uh, working on international development, humanitarian relief, NGO, but I think like they, they need to press the, um, uh, their own ministries, uh, the bureaucrats, the politicians, that um, Japan cannot be so out of line uh, from the uh, from the reality, you know, this isn't simply uh, protesters being shot dead when the regime feels threatened. This is a case where a, a community is held guilty simply because of their identity, simply because of the uh, uh, the, uh, the framing of the military as a, a foreign a potential foreign a proxy. So, the, you know, the, the, the Rohingyas are guilty because they exist. In that scenario, reconciliation between the Burmese society, the, the military political class and intellectual class, and uh, um, the, the Rohingyas are not possible. There is no conflict. If, if there's only one thing that, uh, that, that you would remember from this talk, just bear in mind, genocides are not conflict. Genocides are state-directed, coordinated, systematic, uh, and sustained process to destroy a national minority that has a racial, ethnic, religious, and national identity. Yeah? Rohingyas are considered a protected group under international law. And Burma signed the, uh, uh, the Convention on the Gen uh, Prevention and Punishment of the Genocide on the, uh, you know, in 1956. There are almost 150 nations, including uh, Japan, that have signed and ratified this interstate treaty. And this is customary law. You know, it, uh, the intervening in genocide is as customary as the Japanese bowing before, you know, like a leaving or greeting each other. And, and, and Japan, as a leading member of this uh, world community, is failing to provide intellectual, moral, and political leadership. If Japan wants to compete with uh, China to try to uh, keep its influence in Burma, Japan, let me tell you for the record, Japan will lose not because China is bigger and more intelligent or big. Uh, geographically, Japan cannot win in this game. So why waste your um, soft cultural ca capital uh, the, you know, the, all over Asia? We know that you know, Japan, a lot of like educated, balanced, open-minded Japanese know the atrocity that took place during the war times. But none of us in Asia 
um, has lost our affection and admiration for Japanese culture, society, uh, you know, the, the, the ability to rise out of the ashes of the, uh, the defeat. And we expect Japan to, you know, to do better. And Japanese leaders are underselling uh, Japan's influence, Japan's power, and giving simply money is not the way to spread Japanese influence. There is a genocide in Japan's backyard. You know, like when there was a backyard in European, um, gen uh, Je Europe's backyard in Bosnia in 1994. NATO got its act together. NATO did not wait for Security Council consensus. Yeah? When there was a genocide in 1971 in East Pakistan, India intervened. When there was a genocide next to Vietnam, Vietnam intervened and overthrew Khmer Rouge in 19, uh, I believe like 78 or uh, around that time. So this is Japan's calling. And Japan must not sink to the level of Beijing, run by a communist party, neo-totalitarian, about to commit a genocide against a, a Uyghur Muslim people in East uh, Turkestan or Xinjiang. And so I think Japan has to step up to the plate as a society, as a government, as an economic class. This is genocide. This is not shop lifting. This isn't simply two fights, two sides, you know, fighting each other. There is no conflict in so far as the Rohingya. I have known no other ethnic community from Burma who have expressed love and belonging and a sense of belonging to Burma. They are not demanding anything that we would not demand. I've interviewed, uh, you know, scores of Rohingya men and women. Think about it. Suchi was here in Tokyo, uh, walking on a, a red carpet, telling 300 plus uh, uh, Japanese businesses to come and business in her country. In her country, business as usual. Her her government is genocide, uh, uh, business friendly and hostile to any one of us, anyone, including the United Nations. I mean, like, look, Japan can do so many things. There are 400 villages burned to the ground and being bulldozed, being primed for real estate and commercial establishment. Japan can stop, put a stop to it. Japan is a major player in UNESCO. Japan can propose that these 400 villages must be declared World Heritage Site. The same way, uh, you know, killing fields of uh, Cambodia, there are about 160 killing fields. And then all the concentration camps in, in, in Germany, you know, Dachau, uh, the um, the session session house and uh, you know the uh, um, and, and and other places I've been to. I study under the American interrogator of German SS. My professor at the University of Wisconsin, my thesis advisor, was a young German American military police, fluent in German and English, and he interrogated German SS officers for the Nuremberg tri uh, Tribunal. That's why I know genocide when I see one. I spent six years studying Nazi atrocities and fascism. And my country is, is in the stage where Munich was in 1930s. So please, folks, this isn't simply about news reporting. We have a genocide. For the first time in the social media, you see genocide on your Facebook, on your mobile devices. This is an affront to everybody. Journalists are first and foremost human beings. We must band together when a group of human beings are, are, are no fault of their own, being exterminated. Thank you. Well, I hate to uh, stop you in mid-flow, but we do uh, need some questions or we need to leave time for questions. Now, there are a couple of people who would like to make statements, but I'm going to have questions first, and then if we have time, I'll ask uh, one or two people to come to the mic. Uh, so Working Press first, which is the table in front of me. If anybody has a question, could you uh, indicate, please? And then if nobody has a question, we'll throw it open to everybody. Doors up. Don't forget to say who you are. Yeah, I know am. <coughs> Hi, um, is that on? Um, Andy Sharp for the Nikkei Asian Review. Um, two questions. When was the last time you were in Burma and what kind of reception did you get there? And secondly, which is a bigger question, of course, it's um, what kind of international pressure would it take 
to persuade the Burmese military, the Aung San Suu Kyi government, to stop this genocide and try to put things right. Um, maybe thirdly as well, if, if you don't mind, sorry to ask another question, but what about all the Rohingya now in, in Bangladesh? Do they have any hope of coming home or do you expect them to build new lives for themselves in Bangladesh? Uh, sorry, the last question, please. I just like sorry, do you expect the Rohingya in Bangladesh now to stay there and build their own new lives there? Okay. Okay, the first question. Um, I was in Burma uh, two th in 2005, 2006, when I ended my exile in the U.S. as a political refugee and picked up my uh, Burmese citizenship. Uh, I was there as a guest of the state. And then these are my hosts. Uh, the, the one on my right is currently vice president who chaired the Internal Inquiry Commission that exonerated the Burmese armed forces of um, you know, any wrongdoing. And then the tall man is now uh, number three in the Burmese army. He's my contemporary. Uh, uh, he is the um, chief of general staff. He is a shoe in for number one position. He's uh, about 56 years old. Um, so the, uh, I was an activist for 15 years. I supported Aung San Suu Kyi as a grassroots activist. I was leading the consumer boycott in the United States as a student activist. And then when I, when I decided that Aung San Suu Kyi showed absolutely no leadership, yeah, something that I have been uh, indicated fully, she has shown absolutely no leadership, N moral, political, intellectual, strategic. The Aung San Suu Kyi, from a, le a leadership perspective, is a total catastrophe. Uh, so when I uh, reached a conclusion as early as 2004, uh, the Korean National Union uh, leader, General Bumya, and myself, we were looking for American support. I was author, uh, asked by the, um, the KNU and the Allied Armed Ethnic Organization that's along the Burmese uh, Thai border to look for basically arms and other support from the United States and other countries. And when I discovered that Washington wasn't serious about democracy when it balked a democracy. So I felt uh, that we were approached at the same time by the Burmese military intelligence at the time, General Kenyon, to work with us, uh, to go up with them because they said we are afraid of China. We don't want to be pushed into China's pocket. And so out of these three factors, the military is the overture to the overseas dissidents and, and, and uh, my own personal conclusion that Suu Kyi is utterly uh, failed. And then thirdly, uh, the, um, uh, the, there, there are no alternatives to do like arm rise, uprising. And so I decided to went back to Burma, attempting to work with the uh, Burmese military leadership. I was engaged in what is known as track two, setting up meetings with the uh, Burmese uh, military representatives and international labor organization, British government, French corporations, German foundations in, in Europe. And so I was their boy the, yeah, in Europe, but wh and, and I, w I had my own agenda. I allowed them to use me, and I wanted them to move on the reform platform as th they say they would. So I proposed that they reconcile with the student leadership if they don't want to ha deal with Suu Kyi. And then uh, I asked them to invite the Burmese economists from abroad home to advise them on economic reform. And then thirdly, I said, can you make the internet available uh, for the Burmese? At the time, like internet was like a $200 per SIM card. Yeah, and uh, say, look, we are under, we are destroying our new generation, and others around Asia are uh, having access to uh, high-speed internet and, and learning about the world. And then they did nothing, and, and on top of that, they started shooting monks, and I cut my tie, and then um, I became uh, enemy of the state. And so, uh, in terms of the pressure, I think there has to be some kind of international intervention. I don't mean that uh, Japan sent its defense force and bombed a Nepi doll, or like a kidnap me online from uh, whatever. And that's not what I mean. There are different types of intervention. If anyone who has uh, involved in any type of uh, uh, diplomacy and strategizing to deal with these issues, there are so many forms of in, uh, intervention. What, say, for instance, Japan can like simply say that we are going to have uh, a policy review in the face of a relentless call for uh, ICC referral and, and in the face of the, the impossibility of the um, 
the Security Council. Essentially, for all intents and purposes, Security Council is in a in a coma. It cannot. It has not shown any capacity to address any large scale uh, sufferings, whether in Yemen, Syria, or Iraq, or Afghanistan, and now in genocide in Burma. So, in that case, the individual nations that have signed the genocide convention, that have signed on to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, they need to f call a uh, uh, emergency meeting somewhere, like the Tokyo summit, you know, Kuala Lumpur summit. Recently at the Council on Foreign Relations in New York, Mahathir, uh, you know, Dr. Mahathir, the second, uh, the, the, the reformist prime minister now, I understand like he was an autocrat before, but at the age of like 94, the, Mahathir has been extremely, you know, progressive, I must say. He's even the, the head of state saying that maybe, you know, we will need military action. This is Mahathia, not a leftist, like a radical activist, yeah? We need to take Mahathia's word seriously. If we are not prepared to go all the way as Mahathia suggested, at least, you know, Japan should say, look, you know, we founded your armed forces, and now you are behaving like uh, the fascists in the 1930s and 40s, and uh, we cannot allow that to happen. Therefore, we will cut all, or like, we will put a moratorium, moratorium on like a foreign investment, moratorium on the development aid, uh, you know, there, will, there should be no aid going to Burma except emergency relief aid and uh, medicine and humanitarian assistance. That's one country alone can do a lot. There are about, you know, uh, I can put together 12 different names of governments that will be prepared to follow Japan's lead. If Japan comes, Japan is the 10th largest investor in Burma. Yeah? Japan must not be, you know, seen or be recorded again in history as a war crime collaborator. Thank you. And there was another question. Uh, the Rohingya in, in Bangladesh. Bangladesh are oh, sorry. Doing? Yeah. The, the, should, should they go back? Or yes. Can they go back? Can the can can the uh, can the uh, can the Jews who survived, uh, you know, uh, the twenty plus uh, uh, force and death camps, uh, should they go back or should they go to the Middle East and uh, the West should help them uh, uh, f find, uh, um, you know, the uh, um, is Israel? I mean, that's the same question. Well, I mean. Uh, ask yourself, like you know, if your fam, if you saw your your wife raped and uh, your father, uh, you know, shot dead in front of your eyes, uh, just only a year ago, and or you know, if if your little uh, six months old boy was burned alive in front of your eyes while your wife was raped and her breast cut off after the gang rape, would you like to be told that you know, like uh, you need to go back and that the Burmese? Uh, that this is like you know, telling the uh, Holocaust survivors, you know, like uh, Auschwitz is is. Um, you know, uh, has a new paint. <laughs> Go back. You know, I mean, this is utterly pathetic and disgusting coming from diplomats and policy advisors and world leaders. Go back. It's like no one would tell the Jews and Romers and others who survived uh, uh, the, the, the guest chambers and, you know, uh, 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 the labor camps. Would you like to go back to, uh, to Germany? I mean, look at the population of Jewish uh, people in Germany today. Compare that in 1930s and 40s. Where are the Jews today? Where are the people who survived the uh, Holocaust? Where are them? I mean, where are they majority? They're outside Germany. Yeah? What's so wrong with like a Rohingya needing international protection? Rohingyas are not demanding that they want an independence, independent republic of like is you know Muslim Rohingyas. They said we want to live with you, but we are in a situation where all pillars of Burmese society, the generals, the monks, the Suchi, the intellectuals, the public, the farmers, fishermen, and rickshaw drivers and street vendors don't want uh, don't want us there. They don't even consider us uh, but a part of them. And we have harbored no hatred towards you. And we are only like, you know, one million plus Muslims. We don't pose any threat. You are 50 million Buddhists. Yeah. And so like, you know, this is like, I mean, blatant. This is going to go down in history. And everyone's going to remember what happened in, in these years. And many of, many of the Japanese corporations and Japanese politicians will find themselves again in the bad spot of history. Thank you. Uh, any more questions from the floor? Working press first, sorry. Any more questions? Those all. And then we'll have the gentleman over there, yeah? Hello. 
Yürüyken. My name is Ilgin Yorulmaz and I'm a freelance journalist for Turkish Press. Um, thank you for being here today. And um, just want to ask you about outside Japan. Um, um, it's probably a historic question, but how was Aung San Suu Kyi's position during her own struggle uh, against the oppression? Um, and how was she perceived in, among the Muslims in, in Myanmar during that time? And um, we know that uh, one of her advisors um, was assassinated and she's yet to visit his family. And so I'm um, just briefly on that. And, and the second question, maybe follow up, uh, following up, this international pressure, do you also uh, see this coming from the Muslim countries? Have you seen it yet? Do you want to see more of it? What's, what's stopping them? Okay, uh, let me answer the uh, Ukoni question first. Yeah, um, the, you know, Kony was this like a uh, the Muslim uh, the, uh, legal advisor who, in fact, found a legal loophole in the uh, the military constitution that was designed to keep military in power and above the uh, uh, above the society and law put, uh, to uh, for, uh, for eternity. And uh, Kony, uh, you know, the, very creatively came up with this idea of state counselor. Yeah, and then whose term is going to parallel five-year presidential term, and um, but the the the, the, uh, um, the day Kony was shot dead. In fact, like Kony was flying back from Jakarta, where uh, he had discussions with the Indonesian reformist who, uh, you know, the, the managed the military in the transitional period. You know how to like uh, gradually phase the military out of the uh, unelected positions in the parliament. And so when uh, the, when he arrived at the Rangoon uh, International Airport, he was held, holding his like two or three year old uh, uh, grandson when uh, the uh, military. Uh, basically, military instigated a uh, murderer um, shot him in his back from point blank. Yeah, and so the day that happened, guess what? Aung San Suu Kyi was about to entertain the Japanese diplomats uh, who came uh, with the um, you know, cherry tree as a symbol of peace between two nations and uh, the long, uh, you know, decades of uh, special friendship. Yeah, and, and if I were, I, you know, okay, I'm not the number one uh, uh, the general that that is the most powerful in Burma, but you know, but if I were to say Suu Kyi, you know, she is for all intents and purposes, she is the people's leader. She is the elected leader, and she controls the parliament. She can easily get a crony who own. If the military will not, air force will not cooperate, she could get a crony that owns airlines. It's look, I need a private jet. Because she has flown on Bono's private jet and Le Se Long, uh, Singaporean Prime Minister private jet. She's, she's flown on so many private jets. And here's a situation that called for her, Suu Kyi getting on the private jet, flying back to Rangoon, you know, 40 minutes or less, and, and going straight to the widow and giving her a hug and say, sister, I am really sorry. Yeah, like Kony died in my, uh, you know, in the service of democratization, yeah. Particularly, this is disgusting that she failed to do that because she herself, at the age of 18 months, lost her father to assassin's bullets. And this woman has absolutely shown no compassion. Maybe she feels it, but I can't see, I can't see any, uh, any indications that, you know, she, she is ready to. And then it took about one month for her to uh, say anything. Because then she said it because even the Burmese language uh, uh, media started to uh, you know, express that popular outrage that Suu Kyi did not even pick up a phone and call her. And the, the, they've called like, Kony the, left her, her survive, I mean his surviving family, like daughters, grandchildren, and wife. One of them she should say, like, you know, she, the, I'm really sorry your dad was, you know, uh, killed. Yeah. No, none of that. And and you know they could like she could reschedule the 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 Japanese uh, the meeting with the Japanese delegation that brought cherry tree all the way from Tokyo. You know, I mean like the Japanese government uh, thinks Suu Kyi can walk on water and uh, they kiss the ground she walks on. Yeah, and uh, the, the, in, at Kyoto University there is a, a room where she stayed. That my friend who teaches there, uh, they told me it's treated like a little Shinto shrine. And and so you know. I think I think um, that it's unconscionable in terms of like uh, pressure from OIC. I mean, look, Saudi Arabia. You know what? The, the, I mean, everybody knows the headlines. 
I mean, like how much influence Saudi Arabia has. And then Saudi embassy, ambassador in Washington, I used to live in Washington on Massachusetts Avenue. I mean, he's one of the very few ambassadors who can pick up a phone uh, to the U.S. president. If Saudi, you know, Saudi like, you know, make all kinds of uh, uh, noises about the Rohingyas. There are 300,000 Rohingyas in, in Saudi Arabia with no, no jobs or like, you know, in some kind of uh, indentured labor situation because Saudis don't work. They get money from the government and other Muslims uh, go and uh, uh, service them. And so Saudi Arabia could use its financial might, enormous might. Saudi Arabia can tell Tony Blair's government, drop the internal corruption investigation of BAE, British, uh, you know, uh, the aerospace uh, company, because uh, if you continue with the corruption investigation against BAE, uh, that involves, uh, you know, that concerned the Saudi uh, royal family, we're going to stop collaborating or we're going to stop like, you know, cooperating on the, uh, the, the terrorist uh, intelligence operation. And in Indonesia, the largest Muslim country in Southeast Asia, one of, you know, the, the leader of ASEAN, Indonesia sees itself as uh, bigger than ASEAN. It wants to be part of, uh, you know, the, the, the big guys club. And Indonesia has been consistently blocking any effective measures whoever tables at the OIC and the UN. I mean, you know, of all the countries, I mean, I can understand that a Modi, fundamentalist Hindu, neo-fascist leadership would uh, team up with Suu Kyi and the Burmese military against a Muslim because Modi himself is doing similar dodgy things in his country towards the Muslim people. And, uh, but Indonesia, I mean, like 300, uh, close to 300 million population, you know, 85, 90% of whom are Muslim. The, the civil society is concerned about the Rohingya people, and the government is more interested in getting concessions in natural, uh, sorry, uh, coal mining, cement industry. Five years ago, Burma or Rangoon was predicted as the, the largest, uh, the, the site for the largest uh, real estate boom. Indonesia wanted to buy the Burmese national cement industry in anticipation of buildings mushrooming everywhere. Yeah? And so like, you know, OIC is so split. And you know, look at the Middle East. And so like, where would the pressure come from? Well, the pressure will come from countries like, you know, Sweden, you know, uh, the Malaysia, that, that, that is attempting to punch, uh, punch above its head. Canada, they will come from a combination of Muslim countries and non-Muslim societies and non-Muslim countries. A coalition of conscience, yeah? The governments that at least have decency to say that there is a red line that no member state of the UN must cross and Burma is crossing and has crossed it and the genocide is ongoing. So if we get a coalition of 10 countries, you can end this genocide. Uh, let me tell you, without international intervention of any kind, yeah, and not simply military, all forms of intervention, economic moratorium, sanctions, travel ban, like, you know, the, the world was up and up when, like, a, a apartheid was going on and Mandela was in jail for 27 years. Apartheid allowed communities to stay uh, you know, to, uh, to, uh, to stay alive as second-class citizens. Japanese were considered honorary citizens because of economic ties between the uh, white African government and, and, and uh, Tokyo. This is genocide. Genocide is not about letting people live. Genocide is about exterminating an entire group of humans. There has to be a line if we want to call our world a civilization. Thank you. Now, the gentleman over there, you wanted to make a statement, I believe, or uh, was it a question? Yes. Question, okay. Yes, we have about five minutes left. Uh, I am sorry, I'm we really we don't, we don't, Do we have a translator because we don't... Um, Hi. え、日本における難民行政について
、えー、これだけの数の人たちがあ世界に離散しても関わらず、えー、日本の難民行政においては全くゼロ、これについて、えーえー、ご見識、ご意見をいただきたいと思います。Um, Well, I'll, I'll do it, I think. So you said there are about 200 Rohingya in Japan, Rohingya who have claimed refugee status, and the Japanese government has not granted a single one, or very, very few citizenship. refugee citizenship. Well, refugee status is what I heard. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So,、uh, your opinion on that? I think Japan is still, you know, number two or number three world's economy. And、uh, I just read today in the、uh, Japan News、um, that the Prime Minister Abe is saying that one of his priorities would be to bring more foreign workers here. And obviously, there is a labor need. And then Rohingyas have,、uh, I've just visited a Rohingya family yesterday. Their children look Rohingya. They are、uh, growing up as the first generation immigrant、uh, Japanese. They speak, their mother tongue is、uh, Japanese. And they enjoy the democratic、uh, protection in this country. They have shown enormous gratitude toward the people.、Uh, they respect the customs.、Uh, they would, you know, I think. To granting these people refugee status,、uh, you know, should be full refugee status with all the rights、uh, and protection that are pertaining to、uh, the being a refugee,、uh, should be,、uh, you know, definitely on the policy agenda. And, and, and ideally, you know, they,、uh, they should be granted citizens. Because like, these are, you know, from this uh, 200 uh, uh, Rohingya community can.、Um, You know,、uh, the, uh, the produce,、uh, ca uh, that they can become、uh, doctors, engineers, yeah, journalists, that they can become、uh, you know, assets to the community,、uh, their own community that has been、uh, violently expelled uh, uh, you know, uh, to, uh, the, out of their country. And so I think like, it would be uh, uh, the enlightened and, and uh, uh, far sighted if Prime Minister Abe. Uh, the, the look at the Rohingyas here as assets not only to the Japanese economy as a labor force, but to the community leaders that can provide、um, you know, the leadership and、uh, other assets, I mean, support to their own communities when、uh, the Rohingyas have a,、uh, get their own homeland back under some kind of international protect protection. Thank you.、Uh, we have three minutes left, which is time for another question if anybody has one. Dozo.、Uh, hi, I'm a reporter from Japan Times. I have a few questions related to that question. Can you state your name if you don't mind? Oh, Tanaka、uh, from Japan Times. And so,、um, Japanese government will revise the resettlement program、uh, for a Myanmar refugee. Revise?、Uh, like a revise the、uh, resettlement program. Uh, uh, they probably going to announce today,、um, but uh, they're uh, hoping to accept、uh, around like 60、uh, refugees from Myanmar, maybe including, more,、uh, including other、uh, Asian countries too.、Uh, but I would like to ask your personal opinion about this、uh, government decision. It's a small number, like, but I,、um, I would like to ask your opinion. And the second question would be the,、um, so you said Japanese government never used the word Rohingya, but、um, if they start using the word Rohingya, It probably would be a very small step, but yet the big step. Do you think it's a big step for Japanese government to stop uh, mass uh, genocide uh, in Myanmar? Okay.、Oh, two questions, then.、Okay. Yeah? You, okay. You've officially got one minute to answer both、yes. of those questions.、Um, one is that this,、uh, look at the slides over there. Since 2000, sorry, 1978, that's、uh, 40 years ago, we have waves of exodus, yeah? Chronic waves. This is a cycle of. Uh, you know, people running for their lives, coming back under some kind of like a bilateral repatriation agreement. And look, the numbers keep going up. And today, last year, a total of like, you know, 825,000 fled, yeah? And it, the, that means the repatriation, bilateral, or some kind of Japanese support or UN support is not the solution. The solution is international protection. Bangladeshi Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina has repeated in two 
uh, you know, straight years that uh, she thinks a safe zone needs to be established. Uh, Japan can provide a peacekeeping force. It doesn't have to be blue helmets. If anything, blue helmets have been uh, complicit in a different genocide. Like the Dutch peacekeepers, 300 of them, were like uh, found uh, guilty of collaborating in Srebrenica. And so, uh, the, in terms of like you know, the calling Rohingya by their own name, well, the Jap Japan is violating international cultural law because every Every group has the right to uh, call themselves. If you call yourself Tanaka, I cannot say you are Michelle. I'm going to insist calling you Michelle. That you can slap my, f f you know, you would like piss. Sorry, I mean, <laughs> slap me across the face. And uh, and so and then the the, the, the the my final comment is, this is a textbook example of genocide. Gen genocide has two parts, yeah, in terms of the original conception of the word genocide by Raphael Lamkin, who coined the term. One is the destruction of the identity and the group from its very foundations. And then the other and final part is imposing the perpetrator's you know, choice of identity in the event there are any souls left walking after a mass extermination took place. That is why if you look at Israel, Israel never called Palestinian Palestinian. They always call them Arabs. That's why, the, you know, the, the slogan is dead to Arabs, not to Palestinians. They would not recognize Palestinians by their own chosen name. So by going with Suu Kyi's insistence that they call them as Bengali, actually Japan is complicit in this sociological process of group annihilation. Well, uh, thank you so much for uh, that um, highly charged and um, heartfelt uh, speech. It's given plenty of us to think about. Um, I look forward to seeing it on the evening news tonight. Uh, NHK, top story, probably not. Uh, just to remind you that uh, uh, Dr. Zarni is the co-author uh, of the first ever academic study uh, on uh, the genocide of the um, Rohingya. It's called The Slow Burning Genocide of the Rohingya in Myanmar. Uh, it's published in the Pacific Rim Law and Policy Journal. I imagine it's online. If you're it interested is online, yeah. It's online. If you thank go to my website, go to the writings and then you will find it. Thank you so much. Well, Th thank you so much. Uh, Please do show your apologies, first of all, to the people who didn't have time to comment, but uh, do please show your appreciation to uh, Dr. Zarni for his speech. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.